What's up, everybody? Welcome to the final Friday of the I'm Curious to Know project. I'm here today with Leander Cave, who I've looked up to for quite some time. She has an amazing history in triathlon. Um, as the viewers and listeners know, my background is in triathlon as well. So I'm really excited to try geek out today uh, with Leander, uh, who's coming and joining us from Colorado. Leander, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me on your show. And Thanks for uh, I'm bringing it up the back end if you like with the yeah, last yeah. one. Well, so we've series. got two more. We've got the weekend as well. But I've oh, got you two, okay. Two more tri geeks to join us. So I'm really firing on all cylinders on the triathlon mm. front. But it's been an interesting 29 days. Let me tell you, it's been uh, it's it, it has reminded me of a of a training plan where you just sometimes you just have to keep showing up every day, and that's when the you see the results. So yeah. Um, there's definitely been moments where I'm like, oh my goodness, another another call, but here we are. Um, you've taken on something really interesting this week, and I want you to elaborate. It was out of the blue. It was something you had planned maybe in the future, um, but I want you to share with the, the listener of what you actually took on at the beginning of this week. <laughs> so um, my one of my good friends and I, we, um, we did the Grand Canyon Rim to Rim to Rim on Monday, uh, she's actually a pro, Lisa Roberts, and she's still training and racing as a pro and I'm retired. So I'm not in any, by any means near the shape I used to be. Um, and I hadn't really, we hadn't really uh, considered this uh, as something that we were going to do um, on such short notice. <laughs> um, we decided probably... Well, we decided to tackle it, but we weren't sure we were going to be able to about two weeks ago because that's um, we heard rumours about the national parks reopening. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'll just run. And um, and also my, Lisa told me initially it was rim to rim. So I was like, oh, that's not such a big deal. And uh, on Thursday last week, we found out they were going to open um, the Grand Canyon National Park for the long weekend. And so he said, let's do it. Let's do it on Monday. And, yeah, that kind of uh, was a lot more uh, lot, a lot more difficult than I'd ever thought I was, uh, was ever going to experience. The, the run itself, like the actual running time was probably 11 hours plus. Wow. Um, but the time I was out there was probably 14 and, 14 and a half. And yeah. the distance we covered, depending on what watch, because I have a Garmin and my and my friend Lisa has a Sunto and her watch said 44 miles, but my watch died and it was already at 49 miles with three miles to go. So somewhere in that range we had yeah. um, somewhere between 44 and 50-odd miles of uh, time on our legs. And it wasn't all running, but a yeah. lot of the down and flats was well, not really flat stuff, but kind of easier uphill stuff was running and then the really, really steep stuff. Um, was uh, walking. Yeah. You mentioned to me before the show that it was probably the physically hardest thing you've, you've done, um, which is which is amazing, the fact that you're now, you've, got, you've put your body through so much over such a long period of time and now you're able just to roll out on a, on a Monday and, uh, and, and <laughs> knock off 40, 40 plus miles in the Grand Canyon. What an experience though. I, I would love to hear about what that was like for you as an experience to be able to Tick that off the bucket list, but one of the most amazing places in 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 the world, uh, and you're able to be out there for an entire day and explore. Tell me about the experience of it as well. I mean, I re I've been to the Grand Canyon uh, several times, uh, but I've never actually seen the bottom, and I can't tell you how excited I was when I could see the river. It was, and we started at five fifteen, so just before sunrise, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful place, and it's. It's just mind blowing how like deep the canyon is, how wide it is, and when you're running, when we started running down, it it kind of just dawned on me. It's like, oh my gosh, like we are running all the way down and up and all the way back again, and I I'm I'm just not sure like how this is going to end up. Yeah. Um, I knew I would be able to get through it. I just didn't know how long it was actually going to take and how tough it was actually going to get towards the end um but it was definitely like the most beautiful scenery 
and to be doing something like that on Memorial uh, weekend when, yeah. you know, a lot of people aren't really getting out and doing much and here we are running the Grand Canyon. It was kind of a really incredible thing. And, and yeah, and when I said in terms of like how hard it was physically, I mean, I, I have obviously a lot of people who are triathletes and they, they, they said, can you compare it to like how hard an Ironman is? And I'm like, sure, yeah. it was harder but physically harder because yeah. mentally it wasn't as hard because I could walk whenever I wanted. Yeah. However, in a race, and it's probably different for people, like uh, if you're an age group or not competing so much as to finish an Ironman, it might be the same in that it's not so mentally tough because you can stop whenever you feel like it or when you when you need to. But when I was racing professionally as an Ironman, I didn't have a choice to stop. I had yeah. to kind of push through the pain and the mental uh, tough side and and kind of persevere but yeah I did have that option um on Monday to stop did you ever kind of find yourself on Monday tapping back into that feeling of uh you know that mental fortitude that you had as an athlete you know and, and willing yourself along to do a little bit more than you thought you could or extend the um you know the running portion or run a little bit further up the hill than the last time did you find yourself tapping back into that yeah i at several at several points i had little mini make mini breakdowns what my friend caught one of them on camera i was just like holding on to like one of the hiking poles just like i mean i was in a bad place yeah. many times and again like i just stop reset and a lot of the times honestly it's also uh, the mental uh, tiredness that you're experiencing I hadn't slept for like three or four days before this my dog was sick so I had to take care of him and so I came into this pretty tired and I just had to keep waking my mind up so I was kind of taking a lot of uh, gels that had caffeine in and pretty much every time without fail as soon as I had one of those like it perked me up again and I would feel good to go but yeah. there was just like times where like just putting one foot in front of the other was was getting to the getting to be much tougher than I ever thought it could possibly be, and that's even walking. Yeah, um, I want to talk about your. You know, you have a long storied uh, career in triathlon, but clearly your probably your fondest year, let's call it, would have been um, when you did the what I termed the dirty double. I don't know if anyone else uses that, but I'm using it. Um, <laughs> tell me about what that year was like. That was obviously an incredible highlight in your career. Tell me about you know what that entailed and how that was. Oh, I mean, that year was a very uh, strange year. So I hadn't really expected to win either, uh, personally. Like I was training, I would been through a breakup and I was just training all day every day I didn't really have anything else to do and uh and I kind of felt that and I didn't have other people to train with I I'd moved to Boulder but I hadn't really met anybody to train with so I was just also training a lot on my own so I didn't have any gauge of how fit I was compared to other athletes so mm. I went into the first um the 70.3 and I mean, I'd had other good races that year. So I guess I kind of was showing signs of being in really good form, but yeah. I'd also had a really bad injury earlier that year that no one maybe even knew about or talked about was I had a, a back injury. And I actually, there was a point where I couldn't even walk. Right. And that was, um, I remember getting over that injury on, on the 4th of July, cause I had a 4th of July party on the top of my roof in Tucson. And, um, and I was strapped and taped and, uh, and then I, you know, I managed to like come back out of that and get into great shape and race in, in Vegas. And it was funny because that particular race itself, I thought I was um, way behind somebody who'd come out the water much ahead of me. Yep. So I felt like I was chasing somebody who was never there, right. um, which is actually always good <laughs> in a way. So I actually, um, that race, winning it and being so um, far ahead of everybody else off the bike took me by surprise as well as probably everybody else and then um and then corona comes along and i mean that that i would say i i knew i was in great shape um i i knew i was ready to have probably the best race i i'd ever have in corona still not ever confident enough or um i didn't recognize maybe that I could potentially win but um it was definitely like whenever i started a race as an athlete i would always try to win so it was never like i was not considering trying to win just never thought i would yeah, <laughs> and yeah. um 
but that race unfolded in a way which was very strange again um you know myself and two other athletes who was who were kind of in like a little group together um, we all got drafting or not drafting but one penalty for one reason or another one was mine was blocking one might have been drafting so it was kind of interesting in in that respect and um and I was sitting on the side of the road for four minutes just watching time go by and and I was I no other athletes came by which was amazing because when I got back on my bike I was still in the same position as when I when I actually started the penalty um so yeah I guess in a way it kind of helped me reset and um kind of put the race in I, I actually got to play with the second half of the race and really have a strong marathon um which helped a lot um and yeah again it was kind of a race I'd wanted to win for a very long time mm-hmm. um and I remember saying that to the NBC news back when I raced my first one that I'm going to win this one day but it, it took a long time it took me seven years before I finally won it and um and yeah it was definitely one of the most uh yeah amazing years i've ever had as an athlete in terms of results and um and experiences and yeah yeah i um isn't it the longest time in the history of the world when you're sitting on the road with the penalty you're just sitting there and like either people are going by you're like oh this is it this is the day's done like it's it's such a terrible feeling yeah, I, uh, they mess with your head. I mean, you, you have yeah. to keep everything in perspective, but that all goes out the window when you're out there racing. Like you're out there racing for nine, nine out, nine plus hours for, you know, the pro females. Um, and like four minutes is not that <laughs> long in terms of like yeah. how long you're out there. But yeah, it's literally like the longest four minutes of, of your life. And I was I was waiting there and... I also remember a friend who was spectating around the area where I, where I actually served this penalty. She came up to me and started chatting to me. <laughs> was, yeah, I, it's a it's a long four minutes. But actually, the the penalty's longer now. Um, I think yeah. it's um, five or six minutes. So yeah. Yeah, and I think they have them in a like a tent now as well. I think from memory, you stop kind of in a specific location, not just you know stop and go on the on the course. Um, tell me about. At what moment did you realize that you were going to win? Oh, I'd say probably when I came up to the last uh, aid station, it was probably um, maybe two miles to the finish yeah. and or two to three miles. It's where I actually caught Caroline and she was still ahead of me at this point. And I typically you take a cup off the uh, the table to take a drink and she started walking and grabbed a whole bottle and dumped the whole thing over her head and first of all I thought that's brilliant I'm doing that uh, I'm grabbing a bottle um, but second I could see how much she was hurting and in comparison I I, I still feel like I felt that I had some um, some spring in my step uh, yeah. so I kind of like did the same thing and then came up behind her and kind of slowly but then as soon as I passed her I kind of just took off but yeah. and it, it's not by any means fast because at this point you know we're yeah. 20 24 miles into a marathon it's not fast but felt like it was fast at the time yeah. <laughs> and yeah I felt like that was the minute I, I realized I I, I'm, I could win this yeah and I also know I never actually stopped trying to run fast that whole time because I just knew that Caroline, she's a competitor mm-hmm. and this is probably the biggest win of anyone's life to win in Kona and she's not going to give up easily. So I just kept full throttle all the way to the finish line. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it blew my mind that I was crossing it in first place. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. I, I could imagine the pictures, you know, tell the story, the, the joy on your face if, if anyone wants to go back and look at it. But, um, like, how quickly after the race did it sink in that, holy shit, I've done what I had been working towards for such a long time? It maybe, like, I remember my sister and I uh, met up, like, in the like back of the, um, the finish area, um, because there's a lot of like lights and action and noise and people in the finishing area itself. So once I got away from that area, um, I met my sister and 
And I was like, it kind of just dawned on me. I had a lot of swear words, but in a good way, yeah. where I was like, oh my gosh, I've, I've won. And what I really enjoyed after was every day that went by, I would remind myself I'm the Ironman world champion. Um, and up until like the next year when I lost the titles, it wasn't mine anymore. But every yeah. day I would just, I would say, oh, I'm a week for a week now I've been the Ironman world champion for a month now I've been the Ironman world champion <laughs> for six months so this would go on that whole year so it was kind of fun I kept like giving my little myself a little kudos for the whole year um that's what I really enjoyed but yeah it, and when I watch it's funny when you say you you go back and watch the footage of me finishing it's when I watched myself um in that footage it's kind of surreal it doesn't really feel like me um it's because me the human like the person is yeah. so different to like the competitor because I was a really I was I was a bitch of a competitor if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm actually not a bitch <laughs> yeah um and so it's like you know like I see myself racing and I'm like this this kind of hard person and um but it's not who I am so it's kind of like weird watching myself race because it, it's hard to relate to that uh, yeah. the person I'm seeing um, on TV. Do you think now that you are you have stopped racing that you're kind of further removed from that feeling of competition and, and that kind of innate, you know, bitchiness that you, you had when you were getting ready and preparing yourself? Do you Does it kind of feel more, um, you know, you're more separated from that now and, and, and it's harder to watch yourself in those moments at that point? Yeah, I mean, that's, it feels like a different life. Yeah. Even like, when I'm working out and I'm running and I wear a garment and I don't know why, cause I'm really not trying to run any particular pace, but I do notice every now and then I'm running at eight minute pace and it's hard. And I was like, Oh, seven minute pace used to be so easy, <laughs> you know, and just things like that. Where, but I do also kind of catch myself trying to like push too hard sometimes. And that's where I'm like the, you know, the light bulb goes off. It's like, what are you doing there? And you don't have to go hard anymore. You don't have to hurt. Mm -hmm. um, you can slow down and so I do and then I actually start you know really enjoying it like sport is way more enjoyable <laughs> when you're not racing <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that I'm yet to experience it myself because I've gone from whatever level to oh man eight minutes is really hard what am I doing and I <laughs> can never get back to a place where I feel comfortable again because there's just no consistency but um tell me about what um what that journey for you was like getting into triathlon let's take a big giant step back how did you even find your way into the sport i know you turned pro in 2000 but it was still early days really in the sport at that point i mean i was very fortunate to be in australia where um outdoor sports is kind of like what every kid does um and cans in particular um was one, one of the first places in australia to kind of a have triathlons at all. And I had a couple of role models, um, Brad Bevan, um, you'd have to look him up. He was kind of awesome in his day. Um, he was from Cairns where I went to high school and also Karen Nissen, um, also a great athlete um, as a junior in her day. So I had these two great triathlete role models in my town where I lived um, who end up racing internationally, professionally. And, and so I had those guys to look up to uh, but I was also exposed to triathlon um, because we had local races. My school actually was involved in, uh, with some other schools, um, a triathlon team event. And that was the first taste of triathlon I ever had. I ended up doing the swim and the bike. Oh, sorry, no, swim and the run. And, um, and then I was like, huh, oh, I could probably do the bike as well. My yeah. sister was already doing the whole thing, like the sprint. So I was like, oh, I could probably do that. Uh, and so I did. And then, you know, I started beating my sister, which she wasn't too happy about. Um, and there was like an Iron Kid series. So yeah. it kind of very organically, like I kind of found triathlon just because it was so easy to access where I uh, where I lived. Yeah. Um, and and I wasn't never I wasn't ever really planning on being a triathlete. I I was much more interested in swimming at the time. I wanted to be a, a swimmer. Um, but if anyone knows as much about swimming, you have to start really young. I started kind of more or less maybe 12, 13 years old. And so I really didn't have uh, the background in swimming to be um, a professional swimmer or an elite level swimmer. So um, 
you know, when I became particularly good um, at triathlon, uh, I, th I thought, yeah, I'm going to give this a shot and try and, and uh, turn professional. Yeah. So I think I was probably 16, 17 at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I remember growing up in Australia. My dad was an athlete, a triathlete in the early 90s in Geelong, like before it was even really a thing. And so I would do the kids' race on the Saturday and then they have the adult race on the Sunday. So there was a pathway for our generation, um, you know, to, to be able to get into the sport. And then I've said this on the show before with um, the access on TV. So the Formula One series, the Two is Blue series, and, you know, Brad, you mentioned him, he was a big star in that with Walshy and Miles Stewart and, Maca and you know on on the women's side there was you know Rini and and yourself and all of these athletes that are shining in that and it was a it was a a spectator sport that people could sit at home and watch and it was exciting and it was interesting and the characters were involved so I think the pathway that that existed in Australia was way ahead of the rest of the world at that time. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of. Um... The reason like they had such great athletes because they had the ease of obviously like the athletes being able to do the sport but also you end up having such great athletes and to be better or to be one of those great athletes you have to start racing them and beating them so you know you've got this this standard that you have to kind of get up to and when you can see it and be exposed to that at a young age it helps to to kind of drive you and kind of put in perspective like how much better you need to be and how achievable that is. Um, but if you haven't got exposure to some of the best athletes, I think it's really tough uh, to kind of feel uh, talent. Yeah. Um, was there ever a time when you thought that you would or wanted to represent Australia? Yeah, I did. I wanted to represent Australia. I was just up against, <laughs> back to what my, my previous point, I was yeah. up against like four world champions who yeah. were already on the Australian team at that time. Um, and then you've got like two world junior champions. And I was just like, the talent pool is so deep. Yeah. And, you know, for me to turn pro and to make money, I need to go somewhere where I, where I can be, you know, successful in my own right, not competing against, you know, these world champions and never making a dime. So yeah. that's when I decided to um, to go back to the UK where I was born and, and race for the UK. So literally I'd never, I started racing professionally when I moved to the UK and I think I was maybe 19, 19 yeah. or 20 when I moved over back to the UK. Yeah. What were some of those uh, early days? I'm sure, you know, you're, you're finding your feet as a pro, you're racing in Europe, you're trying to scrape together enough to get a get a get a decent meal and, and and some equipment like what were some of those early challenges and struggles that you came up against oh yeah it was it was a tough way to to um to live <laughs> as a uh, struggling triathlete without any money um i before i moved over actually i worked a little bit at australia zoo and steve Irwin was actually my my, my last boss um so I worked just my ass off to save money, essentially. And that didn't last very long, <laughs> um, especially at the time when one Australian, uh, one Australian dollar was only worth 33 pence, 33 British pence. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I found like just the financial struggle was, was real when I moved over there. I, when I first um, landed in the UK, um, I, didn't really have anywhere to live. It was for stay, uh, couldn't afford like hotels. So um, a couple of guys um, on the British team let me sleep on their floor in a mattress. So that's where I was for a few weeks until I could find something affordable. And, you know, I would ride my bike everywhere because I couldn't afford a car. And I yeah. mean, not, not, not that that's a bad thing because the cycling everywhere kind of helped me, you know, become a, a stronger cyclist. So um, it wasn't, all bad but it was when it was a rainy day and i had to get up a up a hill 10 miles away to get to the swimming pool um and yeah i mean i just trying to to get to places i would never take any direct flights i would take trains buses you name it like just to to find the cheapest uh route to get to races and yeah, I would never, some races would help out and, and um, put us up, which was 
kind of great when you have um, have no real money to spend on nice places. So it was nice to get put up in a nice hotel every now and then. But for the most part, you know, it would be whatever I could find at a at a price that I could could afford. Yeah. Um, Do you think that that build helped build resiliency in yourself? You know, having to go through those things, still making it out the other side, still showing up to training. Do you think that um, made you a better athlete? Yeah, because for me. You know, I became successful. It was never um, – there was never this um, need for money because I, I managed to do everything I did without that much money. So for me, winning was never about making money, right. um, which is lucky because in triathlon, if I'm honest, you don't earn a lot anyway. <laughs> but, um, but for me, it was just about, like, I wanted to win. Like, I – there was nothing more I wanted other than to win races and the money came eventually. And, but just, I had so much self-belief and determination to win. Um, and I think like that combined with my upbringing, just, just knowing that would put me in a better place than what I was before. Like yep. there's, there's no, like, I, I grew up very, we grew up very poor. We grew up with very little means. And my goal in life was to always have have it better for myself. Right. And so I just knew by, like, winning, like, everything else would start coming. It, so my focus was always on, on the winning. Yep. Um, and that's always the drive I've had and still have today. Do you, does that competitive edge and that wanting to win, do you think that was something you were born with or did you foster that over a period of time or were these circumstances really played into you latching onto that winning as the important thing uh, i think i think I, I would say it's almost something that is an instinct in me it was something mm -hmm. that i feel like i was born with yeah. uh, from a very young age like anything i was very competitive my my parents would like when they were healthy and fit they would race us and and I always try to beat my parents and then I would try to beat my siblings and yeah I feel like that was something that I've always had inside of me um, I, I can't remember any any particular reason or time when it would have developed otherwise yeah I, I'm not surprised to hear you say that because some of the best athletes that I have the pleasure of talking to are the same way they are just born with this competitive instinct that they don't really know where it comes from, but they can't remember living without it. Um, and it, it just, something happens. It's like white line fever, you cross the line uh, and all of a sudden something switches in you that you would do anything to, to beat the person next to you. Um, so yeah. I'm not surprised to hear you say that. Do you remember um, what, what were some of the most memorable races you had in, in some of those early days when you're starting to find your feet, you're starting to see some success um, what were some of those social races that helped you confirm that you had some talent? I remember one time I raced in Canberra and I was still at this point a, um, a junior, junior elite racing for Australia. And um, we raced against the pros. We weren't in the same category. We weren't racing for prize money, which was unfortunate because I came second <laughs> to Jackie right. Gallagher, uh, the former Jackie Gallagher. And... Uh, I beat a lot of pros and I could have won some money. And that's when I was like, huh, I'm actually not bad at this. Um, and I would be able to switch and change and I would be able to jump into things off like very little training. Not, I mean, I always had some sort of training. Like I, I, when I was a swimmer, I would go and do like a triathlon just for cross training or something on the weekend without doing any biking or, or run training. And, and I'd do pretty well. Yeah. Um, so I just feel like I naturally had this huge engine uh, that facilitated success in triathlon um, without actually, you know, this is when I was younger, without actually having to do all the, the volume of training um, from that young age. Well, I'd argue you still probably have a little bit of that, seeing you <laughs> walked, walked out the door and ran 40-plus miles on Monday. So you might have some of that still built into you, Leander. Yeah, I think that's more of a mental thing. I don't really often say that I can't do anything. I'm like, yeah. yeah, let's just, like, give it a shot. Um, and I also think, like, the human body is way more capable of things that we don't think we can yep. do, you know. like, And that you see that in, in a lot of things, not just, like, in athletes, but um, 
but I feel like when you're doing it in in a sport sense like you can actually it's a more tangible thing to see yeah, yeah I feel like yeah my my head might not agree with what I think what my body can actually do yeah yeah I would I would agree 100 percent. some of the things that I've witnessed over my time of people doing way more than they think they can possibly achieve is incredible and they're some of the most inspirational moments for the people watching but also internally when you do go above and beyond what you think you take something up from that so i'm sure that you've you know you've got some pride in what you're able to do on the weekend and you can bring that into whatever that next adventure is yeah that, i know i just got to find everyone's asking now like what is next What's next like, <laughs> I, you know that wasn't that wasn't planned that's not normal <laughs> yeah. i don't know if there'll be a next anytime soon i hope there will be because yeah. yeah i really i really like having challenges but yeah yeah you know what now I, mean. I want to talk to you about this body of knowledge that you've created you've got this incredible career you've got this incredible body of knowledge of how the athlete you know the athletic body works and how to prepare and get ready and you've been able to translate that into into business and you are a coach and most recently you've taken on the head coaching role of of peakers and i'd love to have you talk about that and, and what that that is and what how that can revolutionize the industry effectively yeah i mean this is you know it, we're coming into an era where things uh obviously like now especially with COVID like things are much you want to have much more access to things virtually um, and uh, what we've done with Peakers is have like a virtual coach in your hand so it's AI driven with humans in the loop so my role is to manage the human coaches that we have in in uh, the app and uh, and also I, I coach on the platform myself uh, and so it helps to kind of have this Kind of a holistic approach to to being an athlete and uh you know for most athletes um out there they need to seek out a um, a nutritionist and a strength and conditioning coach and you know this stuff is sometimes more expensive uh, to do that and then they're, they're hiring a coach on top of that so what we've managed to do within peakers is to put that all in one place so anyone who signs up to peakers will have a nutrition coach uh, they'll have a functional therapist um, as well as a concierge and then their coach themselves. So they'll have a whole team that's working with them and behind the scenes to help them have the best performance um, they can over, um, you know, the desired race and distance they choose to do. So it's not just triathlon, it's cycling. We have specific cycling and, and running programs as well. Yeah. What are, um, like who's it designed for? It sounds like it's this holistic approach and it probably suits all levels of athlete, but you know, who would be really the target that you're looking to, to bring over to the platform? I think some, I mean, we do cater to, to a broad, broad range of abilities. Uh, and I just feel like somebody who um, wants a cost effective approach to, uh, to training and a very structured science driven um, program uh, that has been developed by some of the best, best brains in the sport. And it's hard to find that at, at a very reasonable price point. Um, I mean, you, if you look at some of the uh, kind of, even if you looked at my personal um, training uh, or coaching uh, that I do, um, you know, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, Dave, Al Dave Scott, Mark Allen, those guys, they, they charge a fortune. Um, and what we've managed to do is to make that accessible to the everyday person who doesn't necessarily have deep pockets and yeah. wants to just have exactly the same uh, training that some of their peers may have who have you know the the means to have a coach like Dave Scott for example yeah or yourself um, <laughs> who are those I don't know who those guys are that you mentioned I haven't heard of those names before <laughs> oh good <laughs> <laughs> no I'm kidding um, so tell me about some of your most you know how do you kind of bring together everything that you've um, learned over this period of time and kind of put your own stamp on this process? If someone wants to be personally interacting with you, I know you do your own coaching on the side, but how do you, how do you kind of put your thumbprint on everything that happens within that program? You know, I just, it's a lot of my experience that I've had in the sport and I have been able to work, win a world title in all distances. So I do have a lot of knowledge on how to coach an athlete for a short distance, drafting, non-drafting, all the way up through Ironman. Um, I've also had to work a lot on, on skills 
uh, in particular my running, when I started triathlon professionally, I'd already had 13 stress fractures in my shins and one in my femur. Uh, and I had to kind of reinvent my running technique. And so I've used um, specific running coaches to do that. And I've taken that knowledge too to, and delivered that to my athletes because I think training remotely is one thing, but it's hard to deliver um, the technique side, which is yeah. it's free time if you have the best running or swimming or by technique. Um, it's also um, more economical. Yeah. And it's for the most part, it saves uh, the body from a lot of impact um, and that in turn prevents injury. So I feel that's kind of where I come from as a coach. I yeah. think if you can train consistently and get to a race healthy, you're going to have the best performance versus somebody who's already always battling injury because they're, you know, they're fighting, they're fighting the water, they're fighting the roads, you know, they're not, they have poor technique. So ultimately, that's my my goal as a coach to get athletes to the start line of any race um, without any injury. When we can race again at some point. Uh, yeah. So I think that's that's also that's actually a really interesting point. I think um, I've talked to a lot of athletes this month and talked to them about their motivation and how they're dealing with the current circumstances. And the answer is pretty much generally been like loving the process and being in love with training and the sport and just getting out there and being a part of that. And I'm assuming that would be the advice that you're giving to your athletes as well is find the things, you know, work on your weaknesses, um, use this as an opportunity to, you know, re reignite the passion and the love you have for the sport and explore a little bit and have some adventure and know that the start line is going to be there when, um, when it's time to open up again. Yeah. And, and, and I think also you've got to look at the bigger picture, you know, and I think, we're so um, programmed these days to have everything happen yesterday because everything's so fast and moving and no one's stop stepping back and just saying, okay, now I have time. Like yeah. if there's one thing we all complain about at some point is I don't have enough time. Well, now you have time. Yeah. And if there's one gift we've been given out of COVID, it's time. And so use it wisely because it'll be gone in a flash. You'll be like, at your next race going, oh my gosh, I wish I had two or three more weeks to train <laughs> or I wish I did this or I wish I had, you know, so yeah, it's about, yeah, take, making the most of the, the situation and like finding the, like you said, the weaknesses or, you know, finding the love. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you go have to, you know, put in all extra miles now because you have the time, but like find maybe like for me, I've found out my mountain biking's fun, <laughs> not necessarily yeah. being on a road bike. So do something different. Yeah. Love it. Great advice. Um, I think perfect segue into my my final segment of the show, which is three questions that I've asked every single day, and I'm going to throw them your way, um, and I'm interested to hear answers. So first question, what's one thing that's changed for you during this isolation period that you want to keep once we go back to whatever this new phase of normal is? Oh, See, not much changed for me when this whole isolation thing happened. I was already working from home and um, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess like a, a lot more like cooking at home. Yeah. I think that's something that I've done a lot more of. Um, I did use this opportunity to do an online course. I used this opportunity to uh, finish my book. I've been used this opportunity to um, to learn uh, the guitar, which I'm still terrible at. Um, so you know, I've I've just feel like finding time to do things. Yeah. Um, I did do a little bit of journaling as well, and and I like that process, just to like kind of like this. Your show is inner voice, but just like put out my inner voice, put it out there, because sometimes I feel like I'm crazy. Um, so when I just put my voice out there and write it down, it kind of helps me kind of um channel things a little better yeah so, yeah more you time i like it um number two what's one thing that you thought was important before this period that you're happy to leave in the past uh materialistic things you know and i don't have a lot of materialistic things but 
it just shows you how we are all the same when nobody is around to show it all off, you know. Yep. Um, we all have to deal with the same issues and the same happinesses or happiness and sadness and stresses. Yep. And it's at, this, at the end of the day, like I feel like, yeah, I don't need much to make me happy. Yeah, very cool. I've heard that and I feel the same thing that, you know, it, it doesn't matter about the watch or the car or the house or the whatever. It's, you know, we're, I'm, with, I'm with my family that I love and, you know, we're, we're all safe and healthy and not much else matters. Um, number three, what's been the most memorable moment of joy that you've experienced during this isolation lockdown period? Um, I would say just reconnecting with friends virtually has been really uh, important to me. And um, it's hard when, I mean, I, I moved away already from a lot of my friends in Miami. So I was trying hard to do that before. Um, but I want to say that maybe on their, their end, they haven't needed to do that. But I feel a lot of my friends now, like we set up virtual dates and we have you know, virtual calls every, every week. And I think that's something I would like to, to keep going because um, Spa like spatially it's hard to to be together as as a group of friends but virtually now we've seen it happen and we can all do it and and it's a good way just to get together and and connect yeah very cool um i really appreciate you being here i i i've i've loved your journey and love following you as an athlete and um you know, I'm really proud of the work that you did as an athlete. And now you're sharing that with uh, a group of people as a coach and working with peakers. And um, yeah, it's been really great to get to know you. And I really look forward to staying in touch and I'll read the book. And um, yeah, I, I wish wish you all the best for, for the next little period. And I'll stay in touch around the adventures you're going to take on as well. Yeah, thanks, Travis. Yeah, watch this space. <laughs> yeah, watch this space. So she's gonna, you were going to run across the country is what I heard from that. Oh, God, you know more than me then. <laughs> Wow, see. Definitely uh, another run. I definitely kind of feel like I could do one and one of those again. Not yeah. maybe the Grand Canyon later in the year. I don't know, but definitely something different. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I'll look forward to watching. Um, this has been awesome. I really appreciate your time, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Cool. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.